let's talk about one more project type. Um, and this is the one where we t you talk about high, exceptionally high environmental targets. Can you perhaps walk me through one of, say, the powerhouse projects um, and, and what's achieved there? I think maybe, maybe um, the latest one, and now we have a couple of others uh, ongoing, and we're exporting it out of Norway. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, the, the Telemark uh, powerhouse is probably, uh, let's say, one that at least would give us um, best possibility of understanding what this is about. It's a very freestanding building uh, in the middle of a totally different environment of buildings. Uh, it's it's standing there, um, either proud or shy, I don't know. <laughs> but it's doing the job. Mm. And it really is producing a lot more energy than it consumes. And mm. it's, you know, the, the powerhouse system we started together with Skanska and, and uh, some others uh, about uh, 13 years ago. And the idea was to be able to design and build buildings that at least would be fully uh, uh, CO2 neutral after a lifespan of somewhere between 25 and 30 years. Right. And in order to do that, first, you have to look at the energy consumption of that building. Mm -hmm. You have to look at passive strategies for that building. Mm -hmm. You have to look at maintenance and the CO2 footprint of maintenance and exchange of elements. Mm -hmm. You have to look at uh, 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 the production line, obviously, of energy that you're dealing with and how much technology goes into that particular building. So the whole embodied material consumption and production line needs to be calculated up against each other for us to be able to meet that goal. Mm. And Telemark is a, is a good example. You know, it's it's this mushroom in the middle of everything. Right. And and it does the job. You know, it really does. And then all of a sudden you see, okay, this typology I mentioned earlier, form follows environment to an extent, you know, the solar panels just to be very efficient, uh, especially in the Nordic region in a context, okay, they have to be angled a bit. You know, you have to get the most out of the sun. Mm. You have to produce more than 630 kilowatt hours uh, on a photovoltaic solar panel for that panel at least to pay back its own footprint. Mm. <laughs> That's one of the big dilemmas. And during a lifespan of, of uh, let's say, 30 years, you have to imbalance the change of photo photovoltaic panels once. Mm. And that has to be part of the calculation. So the powerhouse system is trying to do that at all levels. And uh, the calculations are conservative. So for many of the powerhouses now, and uh, the same with Telemark, we're performing better than the calculations. All right. And I think that's interesting because uh, engineers have a lot of discrepancy in every calculation. They yeah. want to be on the safe side. They they don't want to promise something you can't deliver. Okay. Uh, so they're conservative. But, you know, there, there are typologies of buildings, uh, especially in the, in the office segment. Mm -hmm. It's a little more difficult with housing because the individual mm -hmm. comfort zone is so different from family to family, person to person. We're doing that for the moment also, but I think especially in all these thousands and thousands of square meters office buildings that are being built there, it's totally simple. The uh, the building, uh, the, the photovoltaic on the roof and the south facing facade of the building produces, what is it, 256 megawatt hours each year, something in that order? Yeah, that's uh, around that size, yes. And remember, uh, every place on earth has the same amount of daylight. It's just distributed mm. differently throughout the year. So part mm. of the system is how to deliver this uh, overproduction during the summer in the Nordic countries uh, back to the grid. Mm. Right, so the grid becomes the battery. Yes. Yes, but I, but I, I think the, the number that a lot of people uh, don't appreciate, um, and, and I've, I've worked in a net zero energy building in Singapore, um, is that in order to be positive, net positive, uh, you really have to bring energy consumption down. 
And yes. so the powerhouse building is 70% better. Yes. Um, all consumes 70% of a base case building Correct. of an equivalent size. And that's size the starting point for making this work. That's, you know, otherwise the yes. surface amount of that building would not have space enough to produce. If, if you were working along a consumption of a normal office building, we would not have enough right. space to have enough photovoltaics, not even with a heat exchange or whatever. Right. And that, that's another really important part of the mm. equation, that there is heat exchange with geothermal. Mm. And uh, so there's an 11-story building, which has this kind of a chiseled uh, roof and a kind of a cutout entrance on the east facade. Mm. Uh, it's kind of like almost a science fiction-y kind of object. Uh, mm. Produces 20 times the amount of energy that mm. an average uh, Norwegian household will need mm. um, and it just pumps energy into the grid uh, in, in a surplus. That's pretty impressive. Now, I, I was looking at um, some of the comments uh, about this project on uh, a couple of media platforms, and, uh, and there was a conversation on, on how it looks. <laughs> um, yes, yes. And, and s- <laughs> some, were, some were pretty harsh uh, in their opinion. I, I, the word ugly was used. Oh, um, yeah. Do you think beauty matters in this conversation on science and performance and sustainability? Yes, I think it matters. I think beauty is a, is a, is a deep and kind of humanistic uh, driver. You know, mm-hmm. there are simply things that make you feel better simply by looking at them than others. There's no question. Mm-hmm. But that changes. That's not stable. So what I get happier uh, looking at today is not the same as what I was looking at and getting happy 20 years ago. Mm. So aesthetics are changing with demands. It's not a stable factor. Mm. We, we have to acknowledge the fact that things change over time. Mm. When something's ripe, it becomes naturally beautiful. It can be choice of materials, how you deal with the details, it actually provides you with something better than was there before. Mm. You know, we, we have to reinvent this situation. We have to make sure that when we react, we react with the best possible knowledge we have today and hopefully mm. uh, even better. So this building obviously is, I, if people call it ugly, I don't mind. I really don't mind. I, I think it's quite beautiful. Um, and a lot of people would not, but there is a tendency in this world since the architecture during the 80s and 90s and maybe early 2000s failed so dramatically in its urban and aesthetical context because the industry itself sort of were only looking at standardized solutions and everything where you came around the world looked the same and the same ugliness and repetitive and misunderstanding of, of modernism. But, mm. but then, you know, when something looks different, you would mm. normally very fast say ugly, mm. not really beautiful. As we begin to look at the building as a relational object rather than an aesthetic object, mm. that it, it embodies a set of relationships with the world around it, whether it's the sun or the, the streetscape or the fjord, then we begin to appreciate its beauty for different reasons. We begin to find it beautiful for different reasons, right? Um that's my theory, that as long as people don't understand the, the, um, the raison d'etre of what the building is trying to do mm. or what relations it's trying to create, uh, then we fall back on these form, proportion, style, you know, kind of isms of, of design. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm going to use from now on the relational objects. Uh, I think it's a good word. Uh, uh, it actually does give the impact on how, how is your backbone reaction when you see something. You know, how do you, uh, mm. how do you encourage uh, uh, people to deal with certain types of art if, you know, if you hate it or love it? Uh, can mm. you paint a hand? And if you can't paint a hand, you can't paint any painting. It's one way of thinking about it. But mm. re- relational is, I think you're absolutely right. Relational is, is beautiful. You know, it has mm. this, it has this uh, inherent beauty in it simply because it matches it brings together it's embedded embedded in in that in in the approach of that design and that makes it beautiful but you have to know exactly i agree with you you, you have, have to, to know. know yeah 